from the moment we're conceived to the day we take our last breath, science and the way we use it touches every one of us. Science has given immense power to save and nurture life. But the pace of change is so great that we don't often take time to stop and appreciate how far we've come. That's why I want to share with you 10 of the most important scientific advances of our time and reveal some of the things that might just lie ahead. At the end of the program, I'll be asking you to vote for the advance you think has done the most to change your world. It's had a massive impact on our society. It's really changed your life, hasn't it? So you're the perfect bionic woman. Yeah. <laughs> and the winner, well, it's up to you. The last 50 years has seen science transform our world. In half a century, it's tackled countless diseases, put men on the moon, and completely changed the way we communicate. These are my top 10 advances. Some things you may expect, others you may find a bit more surprising. The first advance to take place in my top 10 almost didn't make it because it's very nearly too old. There are some women who prefer at least to pretend that they're not interested in it and who like to be approached by the man. Oh. But for all its great age, it's made a lot of people extremely happy. How I lost my virginity. Cool. My mother went over the fit. We had a race, me and this girl, to see who could have it, have it off first. It was terrible, but uh, <laughs> we were having a wonderful time. She's got it. Yeah, baby, she's got it. When I was a medical student, which is longer ago than I actually care to mention, there was a revolution which some people claim transformed our society. It was, of course, the contraceptive pill. In 1961, the pill was released in Britain. The day is printed by the side of every pill, and providing she can remember what day it is, a woman can be quite sure whether or not she has taken today's pill. The manufacturers do their best to make them foolproof. They don't want to lose their reputation over what might be called pilot's error. Today, we take it for granted, but for that first generation, it was revolutionary. I was a student teacher during that time, and uh, <laughs> it got round in college uh, that uh, there was a certain doctor in Doncaster that would give the pill, and uh, so we all made a beeline for that. <laughs> Interestingly enough, all of the patients, or we were all, we were all called Misses. <laughs> yeah, if you were called in, when you were called in to see the doctor, you know, you were Miss, <laughs> even there. We knew that there was one private clinic, except you had to pay for it, <laughs> so I had to take a paper round. <laughs> the pill exploded onto the scene at a time of great social upheaval, and itself became a huge part of that change. She's got it. I felt quite liberated. Just to be free of that fear of becoming pregnant was amazing. I was aware that I was taking control of my own life. There was lots of things in the newspapers about, you know, the pill and, oh, and it'll make women tarty and everything, you know. I mean, uh, it wasn't like that for me. I could plan my children and my career, which was so important to me. But what nobody foresaw was that the pill meant that more women have tended to leave childbearing later and risk infertility. But that freedom to plan has, on balance, changed most people's lives for the better. And for that reason, the pill has to be in my top ten. 
It's tiny, but it's had a massive impact on our society. Its liberating influence has been one of the most important advances in the last 50 years. Just as the pill transformed women's lives in the 1960s, science is changing our relationship with contraception again. Bill and Rachel are just about to start a trial for a new contraceptive that doesn't need to be taken every day. You've had three children yes. and you got pregnant while you're on the pill each time. Yeah, nothing to do with the pill, just to do with us. You didn't, you didn't take it properly? That's the one. So what methods of contraception have you tried then, Rachel? Uh, we've tried abstinence, we've tried, because he was in the Navy, so that worked for a while with him going away. Tried condoms very briefly in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And why didn't you want to take the pill anymore? I'm crap at taking it. I'm really not good at taking it. And I'd be relieved to not have different kinds of chemicals and the stress of knowing I've forgotten. And you didn't mind your husband having the chemicals? No. Bash on. <laughs> I think it'd be great for him to take some responsibility. The contraceptive they're about to try is actually for Bill, not Rachel. Now, I know what you might be thinking, and if I were a woman, I might not trust a man, even a reliable fireman like Bill, to take the pill either. But this pill is actually a course of injections which will leave Bill temporarily infertile. So what on earth made you take part in this trial? Mm, um, for me, it's just about being able to take over the role of contraception from Rachel and me being responsible for that rather than it all being left to, to Rach. And did the side effects that they talk about on the, on the male contraception worry you? Um, there, are, there are a few side effects that they did warn us about, like weight gain, um, acne, um, irritability. Did they tell you you might develop breasts? Yes. They did say that? Yes. Because yeah. you're a farmer, aren't you? I am, yeah. Did you discuss it with your mates at work? <laughs> uh, strange, <Did> <laughs> strangely, no. Um, <laughs> what? I mean, the ribbon I'll get, never mind. Because it's a really macho thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it, it is, I suppose. It's fertility at the end of it, and a guy like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really butch. And do you understand the science of how it actually works? I don't. Would you like to know? Yes, please. Right. Let me explain it to you. It's actually quite surprising, and in some ways it's not dissimilar from the female pill, the oral contraception that, that women take. And essentially, it really works in the brain. So if this is a body, the brain sends out a signal to make an egg or make a sperm, mm -hmm. OK? Now, the pill is a hormone, essentially, which inhibits the brain by telling it the egg's already being made mm -hmm. when it's not being made. Mm -hmm. So the brain thinks that the woman's ovulating, so it stops sending the message, OK? And that's exactly actually what happens with the male contraception too. So if you're given the male hormone, OK, that tells the brain, I'm making lots of sperm, so it just shuts down. Yeah. So it's quite an elegant idea. Um, and that feedback is um, one of the most, I think, interesting examples in, in biology of how the body works. <laughs> The idea is that the injections will deal with Bill's biological feedback for months at a time. And this is your idea? So the first entry on my list is the pill, revolutionary in the 60s and still reinventing itself almost 50 years later. It's just fantastic. My next advance has also had a dramatic impact on our lives. In fact, it's so significant that it's played a part in almost all of the other inventions on my list. When I was a schoolboy, I worked in a radio factory. I was paid five pounds a week by Mr. Ben Zimra, a princely sum, to solder little components onto a printed circuit board like this. Little did I realize that across the Atlantic, a man was going to revolutionize the whole process. An engineer called Jack Kilby found a way to shrink all these components into one extraordinary and tiny thing. It's this, the humble microchip. And since its invention, 
50 years ago, there's been more medical and scientific progress than in any other period in human history. The microchip has to be in our top 10. From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, it affects every part of our lives. Without the microchip, there would be no laptop, no cash card, no mobile phone. In short, without the microchip, we'd still be living in the 1970s. It amazes me that today, all those elements of the old electronic circuit board I soldered together as a schoolboy can only be seen down a microscope. And now, the technology is set to make it even smaller. I'm in the London Centre for Nanotechnology, where they make the smallest particles that are possible to be made. And the reason why I'm wearing the garb is because any skin cell in the atmosphere would contaminate what they do. And here on my fingertip is a little electronic chip. On this chip, they can fit 50 million transistors. This, the next generation of mini miracles, is as small as it gets. For now, each electronic component in these circuits is smaller than a virus. And that miniaturization means that chips, like viruses, are getting closer to us than we could have possibly imagined. Now, here's the thing. This microchip is made of a substance which is entirely edible. So when you swallow it, it gets dissolved by the acid in your stomach and it sends a signal to a plaster on your arm. And the plaster on your arm, ow, has got this little device like a radio. And if you haven't taken your pill, I get a message on my phone saying, you haven't taken your pill today. But there's a darker side to all technology. The sheer proliferation of the microchip does bring some concerns. It's worth considering that within 50 yards of where I'm standing, in Piccadilly Circus, there must be at least 50 surveillance cameras recording every movement we make, amassing a huge amount of data over which we have no control. How we deal with these issues is an increasing challenge. Storage of personal data is largely unregulated, and fraud, theft, and loss of privacy in the virtual world worries many people. But in spite of all this, the chip is on my list. And we shouldn't forget that without it, many of the other advances wouldn't have been possible, including this next one. Number three on my list is a device in whose story I, or rather my rabbit Wilhelmina, played here by an actor, had a starring role. Well, a role, anyway. I met some physics friends in the bar, having a beer one evening, and they said, look, we've just built this machine with lots of wire and string and sealing wax and an old television screen, and it's called a magnetic resonance image machine, and would you like to put your rabbit in it? So we went down at the sub-basement of Hammersmith Hospital, and we put Wilhelmina gently into the machine. I was a bit worried about it. And then after 20 minutes of cooking, we got a photograph. And it looked a bit like this. Just a blur. And I didn't have the sense to realize that this was going to be quite revolutionary in its time. I think my pet rabbit was one of the first living organisms to be photographed like this. And the technology, which was then in its infancy, went on to become the MRI scanner. For much of my career in medicine, X-rays were the most effective way of looking inside the human body. But they didn't give a particularly clear image of all the organs beyond our bones. MRI scanning changed all that. Engineers first used MRI to look inside metals. Now we're able to see directly into living tissues, and that's given amazing new insights into the most complicated organ in the human body. I find it really rather humbling that this space, this inanimate object, this brain was once the place where somebody felt angry, felt sad and loved. 
And the extraordinary thing is that until quite recently, we had no idea how it was really working.